Hey guys, it's Jessica Fury, host of Dumb Girl Podcast. Tune in every Monday for new episodes. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Welcome back to Dumb Girl Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Fury. Today, we have Kevin Stewart. He is one of the top agents, 30 under 30. He is an agent with the agency, a part of the Grauman and Rosenfeld team. Last year, he was featured in The Hollywood Reporter as one of the real estate rising stars of Los Angeles. Some of the celebrities he has worked with is actress Billy Lord, NBA player Luke Kenner, co-founder of Bumble and Tinder Christopher Golsinski, and actor Gary Cole. Kevin Stewart, welcome to Dumb Girl Podcast. Thank you very much. You actually did really well on those names. Of course I did. Yeah, that's like the hardest part. <laughs> but thank you. I'm I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, no, I mean, like, I'm so happy to, to have you here. Yesterday, I was at a property and I was telling someone that I was recording. And they were like, oh, who are you recording with? And I said, oh, Kevin Stewart. They were like, no way. He's like killing it <laughs> oh my god he's like so good and he's under 30 he's like amazing like Aww. he's like the work that i want to do and he's like under 30 and he's like so good and he's like built such a great business that makes me so happy who was it uh i think he's relatively new to the mm. company he's in the his name is jack okay and he's in the manhattan beach Com uh, Manhattan Beach office, office. Okay. but then I was just telling them I was just like yeah like it's so remarkable to see this whole like Gen Z of I don't want to say power players because that's I think that's something you evolve into it but it's like these hungry entrepreneurs that put their mind into something and they make it happen mm -hmm. and I think that there's sort of like a misconception that you have to be like 45 years old, 47, 50 to really create success. So can let's just start with where you're at now and where you've where you started in the real estate business. Sure. Just to uh, touch on that, when I first moved here and when I met John Grauman, who I work with, I had that same kind of like eye opening opening experience, right? Where it's like every successful person I met, I was like, oh, they had to grow up with money or they, you know, their family like this, whatever. But then I saw people that were successful. And it was like my first time seeing really successful people and they're completely self-made. And that's where I'm like, okay, there, there's no different than I am, right? So if you want to be so, if you want to be successful, you know, you can do that on your own. And that was kind of like, okay, you just got to work hard, right? Um, but for me right now, I've been with them for six years. And I don't feel like I love hearing that stuff because I don't, you know, I feel like everyone kind of suffers with, uh, what's it called, imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome. Right, yeah. where you kind of think like, you, you might be doing really well, you acknowledge it, whatever, cool, but you see someone else that's a power player, and you're like, how do I get to that level? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think about that all the time. And I think that the difference between yourself and I is that I'm, I made a career change. So mm -hmm. I've done another career for a very, an extensive period of time, and I had a business doing that. And then I 180'd and I'm doing That's so hard to do. It is the most challenging yeah. thing. I mean, I've experienced an other challenging thing in my life that I would never just wish onto another person, but it's so challenging. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the it's a horse of a different color. It really is. It's not the same it's not the same business. You're dealing with someone's assets. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, obviously like I think what we do can be so much fun, very rewarding, but it's also, it comes with a lot of challenges, despite what a lot of people might think. Um, but if you're very conscious of dealing with someone's assets and you're gonna treat it that way, then people can trust you, right? For me, it was easier because I got into the business when I was 24 and I'm 29 now, or maybe I was 23. So I was like new, I was coachable. It was easy for me to learn, right? Especially because I had a mentor. Um, or I found a mentor, but if you're coming from a different industry, say you're coming from corporate America, you take that mindset with you and real estate is the furthest thing from corporate, right? Mm. So you have to lose all those habits that, not, not necessarily bad habits, but habits that don't benefit you, right? And I imagine that would be quite difficult. Yeah, I don't know, like, I've never worked at a corporate job. Or just any background really, that's not real estate. It's hard transitioning into that, right? Uh, well, I think it's a it's a business of relationships and a, and it's a business of people. 
Mm-hmm. It's a business of connecting to the person because no tr- no two transactions will ever be the same. So that's why I think it's a people business. I yes, having the experience and the knowledge to no- to negotiate and to work with the situation that you're coming at, that comes with experience, but the person that you're working with, that's going to change and that's always going to shift. And I think the other side of it is like you you grow as a person you like you're evolving as a person how you think how you mature it's not going to be the same in 10 years from now it may be different for you but you grew up in ohio and you started doing real estate with your mom in ohio can you speak about that i did um so i came out here i told i shared this story with you a couple days ago but i came out here i was a dj at the time in college my sister lived out here and the dj that i was uh the artist i was a dj for was also out here we did a couple shows and my sister drove me around the hills um i already grew up kind of watching that million dollar listing and all these shows on tv so then i went back to ohio my mom had just retired from teaching had just got her real estate license because she was bored realized she didn't like retirement and I was like, you know what? I think I'm just going to join up with her, get my license as well, and eventually move to California. So I got my license solely with the intent on getting some experience. So that way, when I moved to LA, I actually had experience and I wasn't this brand new, fresh agent. So I did that. And uh, my mom and I had a ton of fun. Our first year, I think we sold like 22 houses. And it was great. And it was like the first time I'm actually starting to make a little bit of money. But the reality is, in Ohio at that time, every house that we sold was like our average sales price was like $130,000. So you're still putting a lot of work and time and energy into it. But when I go home every night and watch TV, I see these guys selling like five to $50 million properties on TV. And I'm like, dude, I want to move to LA and try that. Right. Also, it's just so much more exciting and the weather's better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so just picked a random date and then drove out here from California. Or what sorry, was the random date? Did you pick a specific date or it just it was, uh, it was in the middle of July. Mm. Yeah, 2017, I believe, mm. in the middle of July. Um, I just drove out here and it was great. My ex-girlfriend and I did that. It was pretty cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And what has shifted from the time that you started when you moved here to now? And what are the skills that you took with your mom from the mm-hmm. 22 listings to where you are now or what you've created with your success that you've created so far in Los Angeles? I think uh, it's a good question. I think to its nature, like we are in the people business, right? Um, And you have to have good human skills. And I don't mean like sell people in anything or like force them into buying or selling or anything like that at all. I think like being good with people means you listen to them. You're attentive. Like if they have a problem, you try to solve that. Um, You're delicate to their situation. Say someone's getting a divorce or someone you know, has a passing, right? Something like that. So that's like to its nature, what I think will help you in this business. But when I first moved out here, the biggest challenge I had was like, I didn't know anything about LA. I was so naive to every city, streets, areas. I didn't know anybody besides my sister and the guy I DJed for. And like no one I knew, which was a very limited pool of people were going to buy a house. So, um, you know, I wanted to work at the agency. It was just really difficult getting into the agency right? You can only get into the agency if someone brings you in or if you have a high track record of sales. And at the time I didn't have anything. So I remember moving out here, I got my apartment and I just, I applied to like 30 different places. Um, I was stressing about money and I didn't know left from right. So I was driving down to Long Beach to do an interview to sell timeshares. And I didn't even know what timeshares were. I didn't, I just thought I was going for a real estate gig, whatever. And I get down there, I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for my interview. And then I get an email from Amanda York, who works on our team. And it was like, hey, this is Amanda from John Grauman's office. John would like to meet with you next week. Um, I, I saw a posting on Indeed like a week prior looking for like a junior agent, um, which I applied. And when fast forward a week later, I'm sitting there to do my timeshares and I get this email and I'm like, oh my God, thank God. You know, like I don't even want to do this interview anymore. So I went back to LA. Uh, I remember going shopping, like getting a new outfit, ready for the interview, which if you look back at photos on like how I dressed when I first moved out here, it's hilarious. It's like everything is three sizes too big and just so goofy, you know? I was like very Ohio, which is a good thing. Um, So I sit down on my interview. I'm sitting with John and his wife, Lauren, who's the CEO of our company. And 
I don't know if I told them I had my license or told them I was getting my license, but I just heavily weighed on the fact that like I have 22 sales in Ohio my first year, whatever. But I remember John was like testing me on questions about the city and very clearly you could tell like, I thought Santa Monica Boulevard was in Santa Monica, you know, mm. and it's, <laughs> it's everywhere. So I kind of made a fool of myself and come to find out John did not want to hire me, but Lauren was like, no, I think this kid's got something like, let's give him a chance, whatever. Um, so they gave me the job. Some people like the charm, like being charming is sometimes what, yeah. what pulls people in, you know, but you're dealing with two different personalities. What was his take on you coming from Ohio to being here? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's hard to, first off, you know, in real estate, if you're in that luxury market, which John very much is, um, then not all LA is luxury, right? Let's be clear about that. There's, there's an entry level price, mid price, high price, whatever. Um, but it was probably just the fact that like, I don't know luxury. I don't speak that language. Right. Um, what does it mean to speak that language? I, I guess it's relative, but in my opinion, like you have to have a high level of finance. You have to have a high level of things that people like, uh, aside from just real estate, right? Like aside from finishes, locations, lifestyle at each of these locations. But even just like, you know, you have, I meet so many people that know a ton about watches and cars and wine and traveling. I'm terrible at all of that. Like, let's be honest. And I think that I also embrace that. So people don't care. You know, what I do know is real estate and people trust me in that sense, mm -hmm. you know, so. And you haven't chose to maybe like learn more about watches mm. or cars just as like an extra thing or art. Oh, God, I don't know. I know nothing about art. You know, this was <laughs> so I'm wearing my first like big boy purchase, which is a Tudor, which is a watch. I think I spent like six grand on it, which is like for a nice watch. It's very, very entry level price. Right. And I remember I got this and. I, it's like, uh, and I also bought a nice car and after like two months when everyone knows you have it, it kind of wears off. Right. So like for me, I don't like spending my money on that stuff because am I doing it for, to impress people or am I doing it for myself? Right. And also like, I know my lane, I'm not there yet to have really, really nice things. You know what I mean? And I would rather while I'm young, I don't want to work this hard forever. So I'd rather take that money, reinvest it into my business or reinvest it into real estate honestly yeah what is a mis? you know there's i had a couple 20 year olds on the podcast and there's almost like this misconception of the generation that's in their 20s and they're selling luxury real estate putting them making a lot of money aside but it's well why am i going to work with someone so young like i've been on the earth you know, two times as long as you've been. Like, do you have to prove yourself? Do you still show up as yourself? Have you developed certain skills that help you move past the number? What are some of those things? It's a very good question. I think that you're always gonna have some clients that no matter, you know, if you are a young person, and even if you know your shit, you're still going to have some clients that won't want to work with you for that. Right. So a couple of different things. I remember when I did get my um, my last car, which I was just like my dream car is amazing. Um, a client of mine told me they're like, Kevin, you should probably think about getting a nicer car. Like, you know, you're showing up to these appointments and there's an Aston Martin and there's um, a Porsche and so forth. And I'm like, eh, OK, I can see that. Right. Because you maybe want to try to overcompensate in some way or the other. But also, I would say it's not a bad idea, and I do this myself, to have a mentor. Um, like, I obviously have John Grauman and Adam Rosenfeld. And if I ever feel like I'm in a situation where someone is kind of hinting, or I can just pick it up, that maybe they want someone a bit more established who's been doing this for longer, someone that more so is, like, in their journey of life, then I can always call on them to help me. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, like, the number one thing that people care about is, are you going to provide results? So if you show up, you demonstrate that you know your shit and you, uh, you're you not immature, I think, uh, and if they have faith that you can provide, then I think you're good. Did working with your mom help develop these skills or was it an upbringing that you had to develop these skills or was it a combination of both or through experience? A lot of times through experience, you gain that maturity. Can you speak about that and can you be specific with the things that have, it has helped you gain up to this point? 
Mm, that's a really good question. I think working with my mom actually taught me how to be uh, like a more caring, like uh, I want to say like loving person. Like my mom and now my sister, who's also in Ohio, uh, she's also in real estate now. They do way too much for their clients. Like I'm talking about move for their clients. They'll un- they will install backsplash on a listing before they list it. They will do so much. And I keep telling them like, that's, you know, there's a line between being very generous and wanting to do the best that you can do and doing way too much, right? So to some degree, I think I carry that with me a little bit, just um, kind of kind of like being as resourceful and helpful as I can for my clients. Um, but what was the other question? How this, you know, the skills that you have gained as a realtor, mm-hmm. as a professional up to this point in your career, have they been developed from you working with your mom? Was it an upbringing that she was, that she had provided as a mom? Like what are the skills? Yeah, I mean, skills? that's a good question. So I would say that's definitely it. Also, I think my parents both taught me at a young age, like no one owes you anything, right? And it's very much like in Ohio where I grew up, people are very, very sweet, very nice people. So it's like, um, I don't know, the hospitality is definitely high there um like treat elders with respect like all that stuff right but i think being in la doing real estate it's taught me um a lot as well like for example when you're working with high profile clients even though you feel like you want to like build a genuine relationship with them sometimes they don't want that right they don't want you to small talk or ask them how their day is going or anything like that like they just want they're calling you or you're calling them to share what you have to share and that's it right and they're going to like and respect that more because they're so busy they're operating at a million miles per hour they don't want to like feel like they have to like shoot the shit shoot the shit right how do you know that like how do you how, you know and, and i get that but i it's almost like an energy you could sort of feel like mm-hmm. when somebody's comfortable you can sort of sense that somebody wants to for you to open up and have a conversation or develop a relationship with them. And whether you're speaking about your you gaining that knowledge or perspective as an agent or something that can help someone that they can sort of read that because that either takes time or it's just experience. It's a good question. I, I mean, honestly, I think that you just have to, if people want to talk, they're going to talk, like just provide the opportunity for people to talk, right? Like obviously don't rush any of your clients off the phone. Um, I've had examples of high profile clients that if you are like calm, cool and collected and you're at the end of like what you're delivering the message, if you're still on the phone with them, they can very easily go into something else. And then now you're talking about things for 30 minutes that you didn't even, you know, has no relation to the transaction or anything like that. Right. Mm -hmm. But I just feel like for me, I'm not going to start it. If that makes sense. Yeah. You know, I I worked with a lot of high profile and celebrities in my training business. And when I came to Los Angeles, that's what I I was all about. Like Mm -hmm. I was all about that. Like that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And then when you do it, you're just like, oh, yeah, they're just like these people that just want to pay for someone to train them. They're paying at a premium Mm -hmm. to work with you. And then they're just, some of them are sociable and and some of them are just like, all right, cool, I'll see you next Tuesday or whatever it may be. Do you notice from working with high profile or some celebrities that you've worked with, do you show up in a specific way because you know who they are or do you show up in the same way? And do you see how they interact with you to be the same as different? Every situation is different. Although generally, I think I just kind of show up as myself. Um, and I think, I mean, that's like the best solution because if they if they sense that you're not being genuine or true to yourself, then they might be a little guarded or jaded or whatever. But if you just, you know, if you show up, you're you, you're cool, whatever, you're, I think you're gonna be fine. It's, it's mainly different when you're dealing with not necessarily like talent clients, but more so like business managers and attorneys because they're very like straight edge, right? You got to talk proper. You don't really shoot the shit with them or anything like that. And that's when you know, that that's when you know you have to like turn it on, right? They're numbers oriented, things like that. How did you meet them? Because mm. a lot of, most of the time, you know, re- keeping the audience in mind that most people, and I'll just use Los, Los Angeles, their goal is 
I want to be on that five, you know, top 500 list that comes out mid year, you know, halfway through the year. Like I want to be on Tom Ferry's list. Mm-hmm. I want to be on this list. A, a lot of realtors that aren't on those lists that come out on this time of year, I'm sure you've seen them just mm-hmm. all over social media, you know, where it's like, Oh, I want to do that. But in Los Angeles, it's easy to get on that list because we have a lot of high volume. Yeah. You only have to sell 10 houses of 5 million. You're good. You know, <laughs> Or even like two million, twenty million dollars. I don't. I think the cutoff is like fifteen, twelve. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm. I. But I think it's one of those things where people do keep those those goals in mind. They want mm-hmm. those goals, and also a part of those goals is they want the names. They want the names, and they want the numbers. They want to sell. Uh, you know, Kylie Kardashian, Kylie Jenner's new new build that she's doing in Hidden Hills next to her mom and her sister. Right. They want to be among that group. They want to be on, you know, they want to do a dual transaction. They want to be on both sides of Jay-Z Mega. and Beyonce. You know, they're, right. they're thinking along those Kurt lines. Rabbit Horse. Yeah. And, and, you know, and the example is they, they want to play big. And they want their name to be next to somebody who's going to give them some push. Right. And a lot of times, yes, it does. Maybe it's who you know. Maybe it's a client that you're working with right now and they're doing a lease and you need to develop that. And you want, and you know what? Don't not do that lease. I have people that have been close to me in this business that are very successful and they continue to be very successful. Mm-hmm. And they've told me because I've developed friendships where they're like, don't push aside those six ten thousand dollar leases. Work with those people because so you true. don't know. So true. But how have you met some of the celebrities or the clients or the high profile individuals that you've worked with? Do you go to certain places? Do you interact with certain social groups? I feel like uh, I mean that's that's the question that everyone wants to know, right? Because a twenty million dollar deal is fun. A twenty million dollar deal that's Kylie Jenner's is even more fun, right? Because you know the, how much publicity and press you're going to get from that. Uh, but John, when I first started, John said from day one, like you never know when a three thousand dollar lease is going to turn into a thirty million dollar listing, right? Because that happens. Um, there's different ways to get those clients. Like in reality, it's a lot harder than you imagine. I would say when you're dealing with clients like that, it either comes from a referral from a business manager, and a lot of agents are super tapped in with business managers. To be honest, that's one outlet that I haven't like really explored yet because there's so many different ways to grow and build your business. It's impossible to do everything all at once. Um, also, you got to be in like another way to meet them is like just being in the circle. You you hear a lot of these like old time agents, like I believe, and I could be wrong, but like Kurt Rappaport had this house in Malibu. He used to have parties and his was like the go-to place to party. And then from that, he made a million connections and then just continued to grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. So you meet the direct client out like that. But then you also have other people like Zach who works for Santiago and and, uh, the Palisades. And he ended up selling and buying for J-Lo and Ben Affleck from door knocking. Mm -hmm. And it's just like mega superstars just from knocking on their doors, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't think you ever have a way of knowing directly how you're gonna meet them, but just doing all those things, your odds are much higher. What do you do, what works for you? You know, to be honest with you, I feel like my business is more set up to help like the everyday buyer, seller, like everyday family. I feel like that's what I do really well with, right? Connecting with people. And then uh, be, because the thing is like, as much as we all want to wake up and sell a $20 million house, it's not likely, right? So for me, because I was so, I, I, ha- I was so dependent on having like, not, you obviously don't have a fixed income here, but like I wanted to have more so a fixed regular commission here, right? So you want to work on the deals that transact more often, like the one to $3 million price range. So that's what I more so focused on when I first got here. And then there's certain things I do to try to attract those big fish, right? A lot of it is referral system. Um, I have multiple clients that are attorneys or friends or talent agents and their clientele are huge. And I know if I do really, really well for them, they trust me, then they're going to send me their clients one day. Right. So it's just about staying in touch with them and being in front of them, Um, always being accessible um, and that type of thing. Honestly, when you were a new agent and John brought you on, what did he have? What did he have you do? 
just go out there and pick in business or do you make you do cold calls for so many hours? You know, I, I did didn't you your business when you started with him. I didn't do a ton of phone calls or cold calling. Um, when I first joined, it was like really intentional on treating your business like a business, right? So immediately we had a business plan in place. And if you look at like what you can do to generate business as a real estate agent, there's not many things you can do that are proprietary or like you're not reinventing the wheel, right? For the most part, you can lay out the basic five things that everyone knows about. The hard part's actually doing the work, right? So open houses, cold calling, hitting expired, um, target letters, what's some more? You can do like paid online advertising, um, door knocking, things like that, right? So if you get if you get really, uh, you know, in the weeds and you do that every single day, I, I think it's impossible not to generate business from that. There's people, new agents on our team that just come on board. They're in the office every single day for four or five hours only doing that stuff. And then it's crazy to see in like six months, they have so much business now. Cold calling. Everything, right? Cold calling. It, and the other thing is like some of these agents leverage being on a team, which I do think is important mm -hmm. because you don't have any listings to hit and be like, yo, we just sold this, right? The agency is amazing because it's so collaborative. Like the amount of people that I've said to them, like, oh yeah, we just sold the Playboy Mansion. Like I never sold the Playboy Mansion. Oh, you've used that? All the time. Oh my God. That's I, so Mauricio cool. says it all the time. He's like, dude, you can leverage any anything at the agency. Don't say I sold it, right? Be like, oh yeah, we sold that. Our office sold this. Or the line that's that I use all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't even know who it was, but someone in our company sold the CEO of Zillow their property in Brentwood or the Palisades. And I think they paid about $4 million over the Zestimate. So when I have clients... And it's and it's even better for like the the lower um, price ranges where like their house is worth like one and a half million, and the estimate says it's like one point nine, but you know it's not, and you're like, oh, don't pay attention to the estimate. You know, we actually sold the CEO of Zillow his house, and you'll never believe it. He paid like four million dollars above the estimate, which just tells you like it's bogus. Don't look at it. Yeah. Right. And then that instantly is like, oh damn, Kevin sold the CEO of Zillow's house when I obviously I never did, but. Yeah. We did. Are, are you experiencing challenges in your business right now with the market the way that it is? I had, to be honest with you, yes. Um, we're getting pretty creative on deals like contingent offers, lease to own, stuff like that. But um, fortunately, like the past month, I'm busier now than the past six months. And what was going on during the six months? Were you just, were you still able to maintain that fixed commission? No, I mean, the word fix is relative, right? It's never fixed. Yeah. Um, but I think that was right when the, like, the, the market was really shifting. And then I know we talked about this a little bit, but like I went through uh, a breakup, kind of just was working on myself, like working on my, you know, um, self-work, I guess you would say. And while the whole world seemed like it was falling, like work for me wasn't priority, but I I was also like being very uh, intentional about like taking time for myself. And then now that I'm in a really good place, I'm like fully diving into work again. The energy's there, you know? Yeah. It's just like everything's flowing, everything's clicking. I think I have like $20 million of active listings right now, which is a great number for me. Um, and then several million in escrow, although I just had a $5 million deal canceled two days ago, which sucks. Mm. But we'll put it back in, you know? I mean, that's like breakups suck. Yeah, we talked about this the other day. <laughs> no, they suck. It's like I was telling someone the other day, one of my close girlfriends, I was like, I would never wish, I would never wish the pain nor sadness onto another person. Mm -hmm. That's just my my feeling towards something that's that's current. And I would never wish that onto another person. I just wouldn't. But because I'm so into my own... Um, personal development and I'm into my business and creating what I what I like to create which has a lot to do with this podcast and other things around it you know it makes you pour into yourself a little bit more mm -hmm. and you and I were talking about this and that's where I sort of like grasped onto you as a person in this industry I observe people in this industry and I like to do that as a from afar to see how people are doing, how they do certain things. And for you, you started to connect to people in your community through social media, through personal development. 
And yeah, my Instagram you, post. Why did you do that? And what was it that you were doing that you started to connect in a way positively that you wanted to give back to others with it? You know, I um, God, I need some water. Yeah, I will say. Like if you're genuinely in love with someone during a breakup, you're genuinely going to be heartbroken. So that's why it's it's difficult for a lot of people, right? But when you, um, I don't, I I feel like for me, you know, the past four years, I I don't want to say like I always was working on myself. I think I was always working on my business. Everything else, like you know, relationships, fun, everything was all good. I just kept building and building and building. And at a certain point when I did move out here, I think work was everything for me. So like nine months ago or so, when I started to have a better work-life balance and I really started to work on myself and like be in tune with like my emotions and who I am, like I'm not, I used to be like, oh, I'm Kevin Stewart, I'm a real estate agent. But like, you're not only a real estate agent, that's a portion of who you are and that's a big part of who I am, but that's not who I am, right? Um, and when you start doing that, and you're watching podcast every day, you're reading every day. You know, I, I go to church every Sunday. You can't help but just feel other people that are maybe struggling, especially because I'm around so many real estate agents that are struggling in this business. It's like, okay, dude, I've been there. I was there recently, like, let me help you. Um, and if I could just throw out little like bits of wisdom or things that help me, it personally helps helps me as well. Like you say, you dive into your creativity side. That's why you love the podcast. Helping others makes me feel really good. I just, I'm sure it makes a lot of people feel good. Mm -hmm. So many people are just afraid of social media. Like they're afraid to pick up their phone, put the camera on them. They're afraid of judgment, this, that. So mm -hmm. like if you get over that and you lead by example, I think uh, not only will it make yourself feel good, but there could be one or two or maybe 20 people that are like, oh, I like this. And surprisingly, when I did start doing that, it, I think it was refreshing for a lot of people not like people really, really care, but I think it was refreshing that it's like, okay, here's Kevin's Instagram. He's not only posting real estate. Mm -hmm. Like, this is nice. I kind of like this. So mm -hmm. my engagement like really went up. Mm -hmm. People were DMing me like, oh, this relates with me. You have no idea. And it, it's people that you would think have nothing negative going on, right? Yeah, I've, I've heard a couple times because I listen to different types of podcasts, just episode wise. I more go, I either listen to a podcast of a specific person I'll do like, this is a little nerdy, but if people are listening to it, this is what I do. I have taken, <laughs> we don't have enough time today. I have <laughs> taken the top agents in real estate and I can tell you all their stories because I've looked up wow. all the top agents in the business and I'll do what they do and I do what they do on a day-to-day -day basis because I want what I want what I want mm -hmm. and we're not reinventing the wheel, but I'm like, okay, so let me see what all these people are doing. Aaron's a personal friend of mine. I've looked up what um, Braden and and Randy have done. Brands and Williams and Williams. I've looked up what they've done. Um, there's a ton of agents. Um, uh, Zach uh, Goldsmith. I've looked up a ton of a ton of stuff on him. Shout out to Zach. He's a good guy. Um, prior to him being with the agency, I've looked into a lot of big agents. And now this is this is sort of me plugging my own podcast and the agency as a whole is that they're always coming back to wellness, mm -hmm. the business and the relationship aspect. All of those, all of those people. When I go to the gym and I see Aaron Kerman, we say hello. We, we talk about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Oh, what are you working on today? We're not talking about real estate. Yeah. Maybe like a couple seconds we'll talk about it. But sometimes we're just talking about like things that make us feel good. Like, oh, I got to do this. It's going to make me feel good. Yeah. So go work out. And I think just now coming back to what you are starting to connect to people is like, that's what a lot of people, that little bit, it's like that little bit can really like, you know, re-spark um, re something inside of you. And a lot of times your inner work that you do or you reconnecting to a relationship or doing something that's in service to another person, something is gonna shift inside of you. Totally agree. It's like asking somebody, how are you? But actually meaning, how are you, yeah. right? And then answering that truthfully. It's like, we're all human. We all want that, you know? Yeah. Santi touches on it as well. Um, Zach is great, by the way. Yeah. Like, I, I, there's been twice that I've gone, before he even knew who I was, maybe he still doesn't know who I am, and, 
I go to this appointment. He knows my client. They hit it off amazingly. And I'm like, it's, it's just, it's so important and it's cool. And even uh, with Brandon Williams, when I did a showing with him once, I was with John as well. John was like, dude, just sit back and watch what he does. And mm-hmm. you go and you learn from them and you pick up little things that they do and they're mm-hmm. so good. Mm-hmm. And that's whenever it becomes, a, you know, when you have really good relationships with people, that's whenever you're actually like on a friend level versus just being a real estate agent. Mm-hmm. And I say both of them and a lot of people I know, and I have this with some of my clients, um, you feel like you're friends with them. Mm-hmm. And that's when things get really exciting because mm-hmm. not only do they trust you as a real estate agent, but they trust you as a friend, yeah. right? I mean, if you really want to make a lifestyle out of it, and I was watching, um, I'm like totally nerding out right now, uh, Jeff Highland. He took every home and he created a story and he created a story for each and every person that he would show the house to Mm. and when he would showcase the home he would create the story by by getting an idea who the buyer was by connecting to the other agent Mm -hmm. and ask about their buyer what's your buyer about what do they do so when the buyer showed up at the house, he knew that he was selling to the buyer. Yeah, He smart. wasn't selling it. So he created a story by finding out the lifestyle of the client. And when they came in, his listing was based off of the client and he sold it to the person. Super that smart. There. And that's what his thing was. And yeah. his whole brand was leaning in, talking. It's in customer experience. It, right? it is. It is. And I go ahead. I was gonna say I uh, I started to pick up on that more that I have like listings and I um, showed this really famous <clears throat> basketball player a house a few weeks ago and this house that I was showing him to, I, I repped the seller and I asked the agent I said hey what kind of music does your client like and it was like nothing that I would have played it was like opera music which was really surprising but I played that at the house for a Twilight showing his favorite uh, I guess like album and. When he walked in, he was like, good touch. Like he recognized it. I was like, yeah. (laughs) But it just like, you go that extra mile. Mauricio was talking about this. He was like, always write down people's name, write down their kid's name, write down everything. So if you're the listing agent, a buyer's agent's coming with their buyers and it's a couple with two kids, Mm -hmm. you get all their names, you write it down. And at the end of the showing, you can say, you know, you can can address them by their name and say Mm -hmm. goodbye, it was great meeting you, even the little kids. And like just that little experience, you bring that family, is is big it's everything yeah i like the the customer service yeah it's like when we were talking about with my training business i know everybody's birthday do you really yep everybody gets a gift everybody gets a that's card so everybody good. gets a gift that's so good i i i just ask people i get a new client and i'll say hey when's your birthday and they'll say you know march 20 my birthday is june 28th so the hey. when's your birthday i'll be like oh my birthday is june 28th and it goes in my calendar very smart. It goes right in my calendar. Because you I'm do that in real estate too. That's going to be a really good because move. Because it's um there. I learned this when I first got into the business. I was with Keller Williams for about two months, and I'm a very tenacious person. So if I don't, if I'm not getting what I need, I need to just keep going and just mm-hmm. keep asking until I get it. Which, which is why I poured into hearing what so many of the agents were doing. I'm like, I need so to see smart. what these top yeah. agents are doing. But Keller Williams has this thing called um. It's either called 30 touch or 10 touch or 20 touch. Something like that. Yeah. It's like one person and how can you touch them? Not maybe touch them. (laughs) Maybe you can (laughs) touch them. Touch them. (laughs) Listen, one of You got to be careful what you say (laughs) these days. (laughs) One of my girlfriends girlfriends swears my husband works in this industry. Somewhere in the industry. One of my girlfriends is like, I swear your husband is somewhere in your industry. I'm like, all right, we'll just put yeah. it out there. There's like a 10 touch. So it's mm-hmm. like um, one, it's a initial. Two, it's a call. Three, you add them on social media. Four, you send them a text. Five, you pick up the phone. Seven, you like uh, send them a birthday card. Eight is like you send them um, like a newsletter. It's, mm-hmm. it's always like 10 touches. Always something different. Yeah. yeah, it's like 10 touches or something per client. And it's a way of connecting to them. And I would love for you to just share some of the specifics that you did for your personal development and how it has now, during those six months, what were those specific things that you did during the time of your breakup? Mm -hmm. I want you to get as specific as possible. Oh man, as specific as possible. I like specifics because specifics is what drives people 
to get out of this space that they're in of something that's not working. Something isn't Fair. working. And when people hear something, most of the time through audio or through visual, whether through a podcast or through a video, they're like, shit, this is why I need to meditate. That fucking girl on Dumb Girl Podcast is always mm -hmm. talking about her meditation practice. And now has it, how it's shown up in your business. What were some of those specific well, things that you were doing? Speaking of specifics, like when you listen to a business coach or anything like that, everyone always says you have to be specific because otherwise you can't be that intentional on it. You flow everywhere, right? That's why I forget who it was. Um, but they're like, what's your, what's your um, business plan? Like, what's your goals this year? And then a lot of people, even myself right now, I'm actually afraid I'm not going to be as specific as, I like, as I'd like to be. And then I'd like think to myself, okay, I need to do this. But for me, um, I think what really flipped a switch for me is whenever I'm like, okay, I'm not going to have the victim mentality. Like, I'm not going to be a victim of my own sadness or whatever that is. Um, but it was a big wake up call because I was just so focused on work that I'm like, oh shit, okay, I need to focus on myself a little bit. Like, why am I sad about this? What, like, what's going on? And I was just very out of touch with anything that would help me, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I've gone through periods of time where I have like done meditation and things like that, but I never stuck, stuck to it. And I never, I, I like, there were times where I started a book. I never finished the book. Right. Mm -hmm. So during this time. When you're living by yourself, you're at home every night. Um, I kind of didn't go out for a while at first. I just was like, let me just get through like the the lonely part, I guess you will. So I did that. And then as I started to do like, okay, let me pick up this book. Let me read. Okay, let me watch this YouTube video on um, whatever it is. I was it a specific YouTube person? Uh, I watched a lot of uh, the church I go to, Mosaics, read broadcasts like all the time. Okay. Um, I watched... Um, Bedros Koulian, which I really, I watch his podcast and I listen to his podcast, watch his videos every single week. And I started listening to like uh, worship music for me. Like I did all that. And then I just kind of got like in love with the way that it was helping me and made me feel. I started journaling, which I think journaling is really important because mm -hmm. if you're like me, like you're so busy with work, I forget shit all the time. Like I just forget so much. So even to this day, I'll go back and read through my journal and I'll be like, oh my God, this is where I was nine months ago. This is where I was seven months ago, five months ago. And I gradually watch myself get happier and happier where I say things that like, you know, I'm sad today. I feel lonely today or whatever it is, or I had a bad day. Like it, they get better and better and better. And then they start focusing. And I literally have the journals. They start focusing more on today was an amazing day. And then I helped this person today. And as I started to work on myself, I think people really felt that energy, at least like my close friends did. So when the market was shifting, everyone was going through a hard time, including myself, like work and whatever, um, people would reach out to me and they'd be like, oh, dude, you got to watch this video. I have like a, I can't meditate for a long time, but I have this, this woman, it's a five minute morning meditation. She's amazing. And included in that is like affirmations, like two minutes of affirmations. And they're really like beautiful affirmations. So I'll send that and I'll send this and I'll say, you should read this book. And then people are like, oh, dude, this is so good, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a big one is like, start working out, move your body. Mm -hmm. I finally, you know, I played sports all throughout elementary and high school and I played college sports that after college, I was like, oh, dude, I don't want to go to the gym. But then I started working out again and that immediately boosts my mood and helps me feel better. Yeah, that's really, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I can... I think because I do meditate, I find it to be really helpful. Mm -hmm. But I talk about it on so many different, so many different episodes. Um, but I think that creating a community around people that speak the same language, it's like surrounding, I was listening to it on the way here, like surrounding yourself, even with people that are doing what you want to do because that's gonna like up your mood. For sure, You know, and it's gonna help you stay consistent. Yeah, I go to well, therapy, I see a therapist like once a month and I'll just like check in with her. And you know, she said something to me the other day, she was like, the moment that you realign your energy like 100% onto you, and like the moment that you put your energy onto another person, you're gonna shift, mm -hmm. it's gonna shift, but you have to put it back to you. And if you choose to share personally with friends or people that you're very close with, share it with people that are, they're not gonna feed it negatively mm -hmm. or feed the sadness. They're gonna feed it with 
comfort and and support and positivity because the positivity that's a really important is what's going to re re um it's something in your brain where it kind of like shifts your brain to start think more positively mm -hmm. because the people around you know that you're experiencing something that they're like oh my god but you're so good like you're you do this so well like you're so focused on that and you're you start to build your self-confidence and your self-esteem and a lot of things that maybe people in real estate struggle they don't struggle with but maybe they do they hear it and they're like well i'm not successful i'm not in a place that i'm like fully self-confident and i'm not closing at least 50 million or 100 million in transactions a year how am i supposed to feed my self-confidence when the outside isn't isn't there that i mean that's major and by the way i started going to therapy as well i forgot to include that but <clears throat> i think it's awesome and like you know what no one that I knew growing up, literally, I don't think I knew a single person in Ohio that went to therapy. Yeah. Maybe people like did, they just didn't share. It's a, There's definitely a stigma. There was a stigma. There was a stigma. There's definitely not anymore. Yeah. Uh, and I love sharing that because I think that like, when you don't worry about what other people say, and I think we all do, I still do, but you'll just be like, oh yeah, I started going to therapy. It's great. You should, Have you ever been? <laughs> like, I don't think there's, I, I think it's great. I'm a big you know advocate of it. But um, one of the guys I listen to in his podcast, he's talking about stacking wins because like usually your goals are so far out, right? They're usually a year goal. Some people maybe have a five-year goal, whatever, but generally it's like a year goal, right? It's so, it's so easy to get focused only on that goal that throughout the process, you don't feel like you're doing as well, right? But if you, and I have this in my journal where um, I don't do it every day, but I do it quite often, Every day I, I write down three wins for the day and then three goals for tomorrow. Mm. And then three wins for the day, three goals for tomorrow. And stacking wins, especially mm -hmm. it's really important in the morning, like stack your wins, mm -hmm. is gonna propel you throughout the rest of your day. Mm -hmm. Because then when you don't hit 50 million, you hit 45 million, you don't, you're not mad or upset with yourself because also you have to realize like, part of the beauty is being alive and dude, sell $45 million, mm -hmm. it's great. You, you definitely have money in your bank account if you, you know, do well, yeah. uh, or if you don't spend everything. But you're going to be fine. You're going to be really happy, which I think, honestly, being happy is like one of the most important things in the world. Yeah. So it's a one day at a time thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so grateful and gratitude and gratitude is definitely something you can always find. I'm so grateful, Kevin, that you came onto the podcast. I really appreciate it. And then people get to hear more about you. And. I like to ask all my guests three questions before that they leave. Okay. I mean, they can always come back. What is a non-negotiable in your morning routine that sets you up for the day? Mm. I I mean, I read every single morning. I think uh, even if it's five pages or 15 pages, it takes my mind off of like the worry of the day or like what I have to do. And it kind of allows me, even though it's a self-help book, I'm reading Untethered Souls right now. Oh and God, I did so good. So good. Michael Singer. Yeah. It's so good. It's, sorry, I, I listened to one of his podcasts. It was like an hour so long. Good. And I'm like, dude, this dude is so smart. I have to read his book. Yeah, he's great. Um, but I think I did it backwards because I, I read Living Untethered first oh. and then this one. Yeah. So whatever. I um, did, no, I did The Untethered Soul and then I... The that's the correct order, by the way. I'm oh, pretty really? sure. Yeah, I did it backwards. Who fucking knows? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but anyways... I do that every morning and it just helps set me up. So and it's good. like a little reminder. It's you know? so good because his book is like a meditation. It because is. Because he teaches you how to be super present in yeah. what's going on and in where like you don't have to worry. You literally, it's so, I mean, I still worry. I know we all yeah, still yeah, worry. Yeah. What I really like is that. And then also talking about like creating your energy mm -hmm. and he uses the metaphor, which is so true. It's like, it's not what you eat. It's not, it's not what you do, but like, he, this was in one of the chapters I read. It's like, imagine you're going through a breakup and then out of nowhere, your ex calls you and says, hey, I'm so sorry I made a mistake. I'm coming over. Like your energy is going to shoot up like that. So you can create that energy anywhere for the right reasons, yeah. you know? I think that's cool. Uh, can you leave the listeners with one suggestion or piece of advice they can apply to their daily routine, business, and or relationship? Mm. Daily routine, business, or relationship? I would say something that I still struggle with that I think is very important for anything that you do, be a good listener. I think that that's such a base, especially in real estate, but no matter what you do, I think being a good listener, people need that right now. You know, they, they need someone that can listen to them and it's just going to help. It's going to help you. Yeah. I think I, I heard once before that 
if you ask a client a question, as much as you want to say something after that question, it's almost like, shut, don't say anything mm-hmm. at all. Like, give them a second to answer because if you answer and you cut them off, they're going to not answer the way that they want to. Yeah. They're trying to construct their thoughts. Yeah. And a, and a lot of people find that to be like a very powerful way of expressing their own wisdom and connecting to the other person by that pause, that like hard pause that you take. It. I think that's so true. And it's also really hard to do because when you are in back to back to back appointments, you have a lot of things going on, you know, people are trying to get a hold of you. It's so easy to like talk fast, this, that, whatever. I've left appointments and I'm like, oh, I feel like I talked way too much and I hate it. It's the worst. Um, It's not the biggest deal in the world, but I do think if you can be careful on that, it's going to help you a lot. Yeah. What are three qualities peers of yours would say about you? Wow. Three quality peers of uh peers of mine would say uh i think that i i think they would say i'm a good friend because i think during this period like uh i've tried to be a good friend for a lot of people um i think that my clients would say that i care about them right genuinely you know i i i will tell people not to buy something because i don't think it's a good deal Mm -hmm. right so they know i'm not just trying to sell them on anything and then um I don't let things fall through the cracks. Like, I feel like I'm always going to get back to you. I'm always going to, even if it's not good news, like I'm always going to deliver, you know, the news. Thanks, Kevin. Where can people find you? Plug yourself. Plug myself. You can find me on Instagram at Kevin X Stewart. Um, That's kind of it. You can follow my LinkedIn and everything, but it's, Who follows LinkedIn? I don't know. Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. Thanks, guys. You can follow me at Jessica J. Fury. You can follow the podcast at Dumb Girl Podcast and follow the real estate page at Jessica Fury Real Estate. And now support us on YouTube, Dumb Girl Podcast. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.